I'd like to thank you for giving me this opportunity um, and for all of you for being here to listen. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, St. Peter and Paul Cathedral, which most of you must have seen. And um, the main topic of the presentation will be the past precautions taken. And, um, the past precautions taken against uh, earthquakes throughout its history. So, during the total extent of the research is actually bigger, bigger than this, but um, my presentation today will be limited on some parts of it. So, during the technical research, um, so there were seven different laboratory tests conducted on the samples taken from the monument. Um, two non-destructive testing methods were used. Um, these are namely georadar, GPR, and an uh, infrared camera. Then structural modeling was done on some parts uh, with finite, finite element methods um, on selected areas of the building namely the later addition flying buttresses at the south facade of the building, which you can see at the down, down picture. And today's presentation, it will focus on um, the construction techniques, identifying the structural damages, and past earthquakes endured by these buildings, and the measures taken in the past against these earthquakes. So, the church is located on the east of Cyprus. The monument is located inside the city walls of Hamagusta, which, as you know, it was a medieval trade city with an important port, important harbor. Hamagusta has reached its um, peak in richness during the medieval period. Therefore, we have a lot of architectural monuments remaining from that period. Here you can see uh, St. Peter and Paul Cathedral from the picture, picture is taken from St. Nicholas Cathedral at the back on the right. And on the maps, as you can see uh, in the engraving by uh, Henri de Bivot, 1615, you can see the location and also in the maps of Amundsen. It's very close to both St. George of the Greeks and St. Nicholas. So this monument has witnessed um, various uh, reigns and the rivalries of rich and various empires during seven centuries. Its construction began in the year 1358 till 1369 during the Lusignan dynasty, so in 14th century building. The current condition of this church, of course, offers us insights on the engineering, aesthetical, and religious beliefs and enlightenments of those eras. It shows differences from a typical Latin cathedral, typical Gothic cathedral. Um, which the St. Nicholas is a very typical one. So they are from the same century, but they show differences in um, architectural style. Other than the richly decorated North Port, which uh, in normally, as you know, the, the um, West Port is um, the richest decorated, like in um, St. Nicholas. But in this cathedral, only the north port is richly decorated. And the effect on the eastern effect can be felt easily on the, on the church. There is a possible grave uh, believed to be from 14th century in its name. Uh, this we detected by the GPR, non-destructive georadar measurement. Also, since it was turned into a mosque in the um, 16th century, its garden became a hazira, which is like a graveyard, almost. 
Then um, there are graves from the Ottoman Empire there. The grave belongs to the Ottoman ambassador to France in the 17th century. The monuments contains the construction techniques of three different periods. Uh, since additions and alterations and measures were made during this, this period. Um, first period is the Lusignan period. You can see the West Passat. The second period in, uh, is Venetian period. And the third period is the Ottoman period. So the, the top small windows are believed to be added in the Venetian period, making rooms. And the minaret and the flying buttresses on the south are believed to be added by the Ottomans. And the original design is, as you can guess, um, more, more symmetric. And of course, it had in 700 years, it had a lot of different functions. In the Latin period, it was a church. Then it was mosque in Ottoman period, Sinan Pasha Mosque. Then in the British coloni colonization period, it became the uh, storage for potatoes and meat. Then after 1960, it had a lot of uh, different functions. Actually, still today, we are trying to find a really good function for this building that is sustainable. Because as you know, as it also says in the Venice chapter for restoration, that if a building has a use, then it's good for its lifetime, right? So uh, it has become a cultural center, then a wedding hall, then library, then mosque again, then it was closed with no function. And now it is also, again, like an exhibition hall that sometimes opens for art exhibitions. But it would be very good to have a constant function that gives the building life. As far as, now if we go a little technical, the construction techniques, the ruins of St. George of the Greek Church, which is located very close to this, uh, to St. Peter and Paul Church, uh, offers us a lot of insights. Both churches have almost the same um, period construction technique and materials. St. George of the Greek Church, which is half collapsed today, offers us important information on how the columns, walls, and walls are constructed in St. Peter and Paul. Um, for example, if we go to the walls, uh, they are constructed with ashlar limestone placed in a staggered manner. These stones are between the rib arches and above them there is a relatively lighter infill. Uh, this lightness is achieved by using empty pottery between the infill. So you can see here the empty pottery. This construction technique not only gets rid of the heavy infill but also contributes to the better acoustics of the building. So it has um, two uses. Also in um, recently in Suleymaniye Mosque, during a restoration, they were doing injections, which is injecting mortar into the dome. And they found out that the mortar goes very fast, rapid. And after that, they found out that they, the Suleymaniye Mosque has the same potteries inside. So you have to be very careful, you have to know the construction techniques before deciding the intervention method. The walls are 150 centimeters in thickness, just as they are in St. Peter and Paul. And it's a double leaf construction technique. So the leaves, external leaves, are made up from cut limestones, uh, 35 to 40 centimeters in thickness. Then the infill is made up of rubble stones and mortar, but very good rubble, mortar and rubble stone. So it's not like a soil and stone thrown into. It, it is it is done in a um, proper manner. 
Then the columns, the pillars, they are cylindrical and there are monolithic stones inside at the centers. Then the diameter of these pillars are increased by, by the stones laid around them. And um, our building has a symmetrical plan of 24 to 17 meters, and the height is uh, approximately 20, 20 meters. We have three names, and these names end up with three abscesses covered with half tones, so very eastern. Then um, there are in total eight pillars in the building. The diameters are 125 each. Then the colonnades that spring out from the capitals of these pillars meet at the roof, as you can see on the picture on the left. Then here you can see a, a cross section showing the construction techniques of the pillars of the double leaf wall and um, of the infills. And like I said, this cross section already exists in St. George because of the way it collapsed. So it, it is very important for us. Um, after the construction techniques, you can go on to the damage identifications. Um, because, because I'm a civil engineer, I will go into more structural damage identifications. As you can see, the detachment between the main arch and the infill material and the flying buttresses in the southern facade. Then um, outward plane movement on the walls on the southern facade. This outward plane movement means uh, the walls lean out of the plane. Plane is straight and it leans out of the plane. This is a very typical um, damage in masonry buildings because the roof tends to push the walls out of plane. And measures are taken against this in general. But in the, of course, in um, in Europe, where there are not many earthquakes, the measures are a little different, like the flying buttresses that holds the walls in plane. But in earthquake-prone areas, you have to be a little more creative. You have to have ties to, to control the walls during um, earthquakes. And since the walls go out of plane, then structural cracks open, so in the wall, in the roof like the ones that I marked. And also you can see vertical cracks uh, on the western facade. So, the earthquakes in Cyprus throughout history, the measured and non-measured ones. Um, one of the measured ones in 1941, um, 20th January 1941, 5. Uh, nine Richter scale, it caused extensive damage in Famagusta region. Uh, in historical documents, as mentioned in Basil Stewart's 1908 date book, the devastation on monuments can be understood actually. He says the island has witnessed the battles of many nations, and the nations or the empires left a lot of monuments and uh, they exercised their powers against one another, each new conqueror obliterating the works of the one vanquished. But where the man has been wanting, the forces of nature in the form of storms and earthquakes have mingled in common destruction of the triumphs of many hands and periods. So a lot of damage has been done by the earthquakes to the monuments. And the major earthquakes, it starts from 1896. And like I mentioned before, uh, the one in the middle, uh, has caused high degree damage around the Augusta region. 
the others in Limassol region, Pathos region, Mesoria region, but high degree damages are in general in Paphos, in Famagusta, and in the southwest Cyprus, because of, um, because of the Cyprian arc uh, in plate, plate tectonics theory. There is an arc under Cyprus. So uh, from here you can understand why the damages are more in Paphos, more in Famagusta, and not in Kyrenia, not in Nicosia, because the earthquakes occur along this arc, the Cyprian arc, and in general affect the southern and the southeastern part of the part of the island. But of course, more important, maybe, for for our topic, because we deal with uh, monuments and historical structure, the past earthquakes that occurred in Cyprus before modern measurement techniques. You can see from historical research that there are earthquakes from 1492, 1546, and um, uh, quite frequent in 1568 and 69. And then you have the great uh, 1735 earthquake, which is uh, one of the biggest natural disasters happened on the island. Uh, after, uh, after these earthquakes and the damages, there were uh, past interventions. So the flying buttresses and the minaret were added after uh, 1568 earthquake. Basic repairs were done after 1735 earthquake. The repairing of the flying buttresses and the lowering of the ground soil level was between 1937 and 1945 at the colonial times. Then also reinforced concrete tie, tie beams were added in 1950s by, by British uh, colonial government. Then extensive rest structural restoration was done between 2009 and 2010. Uh, additional flying buttresses and minaret was done after 1546. And like I told you, the southern facade were out of plane and it was supported by these measures during Ottoman era. So these flying buttresses down are measures against uh, against earthquakes. And the flying buttresses, it was, during the research, it was analyzed uh, in a finite, finite element method. Uh, and because we thought that it can, could act like a mass damper, so this type of analysis was chosen. And once you model, um, model the buttresses, then you see the typical damage occurring if you model an earthquake. So, also in, um, as Enlar said, in spite of its massive structure and sound appearance, the church of St. Peter and Paul was much disturbed during the earthquake, so 1568. It was at one of these days that the part of the flying buttresses were added and others were built to support the aisle walls on the south. So they are guessing when it was uh, built. In 1899, he is guessing. This is the condition of the flying buttresses before, before restoration. Also, the building continues to spy, stand in spite of many earthquakes during the past few centuries, but uh, it's much cracked and at some period a row of heavy and unsightly flying buttresses has been built against the south side to remedy the effects. By George Jeffrey in Mon Historic Monuments of Cyprus in 1919. So, okay, um, of course these flying buttresses were a big heavy intervention on the architecture of the building and he is mentioning it um, here. As you can see, they are really changing the appearance and changing the symmetry because you don't have them in the other side. 
Then the flame buttresses were repaired and uh, the ground soil was lowered between 1937 and 1945. At one point, one of these flame buttresses also collapsed and we was rebuilt. The one at the very right. And here you can see uh, engraving from 1695. Uh, here, if you look at it in an earthquake point of view, the, the engraving, you can see that in 1895, how many, what parts of what buildings are still standing? For example, you can see the minaret added to St. Peter and Paul Church was still standing in 1695. Therefore, you can conclude that the minaret probably collapsed in the first earthquake that was after 1695. Also, the collapse of the St. George of the Greeks, which is believed by some to take place in 1571 Ottoman Venetian War, can also be attributed to <coughs> to the 17th earthquake. So you can see the dome uh, and the building, St. George of the Greece, in type. And so this offers in important insights of the extent of the damages caused by the great 1731, 35 Okay, this is a very big um, intervention in 50s. The reinforced concrete tie beams on the roof. And these tie beams also raises the question on which of the other 14th century buildings such as St. Nicholas have gone under similar measures. As you can see, the tie beams and the rebars being connected. Of course, in today's restoration principles, we don't do this. But I still cannot say that this was bad. Because now we don't do it because in 50 years, the iron gets rusted and it becomes, uh, it loses its purpose. But during the, those times, this was the idea. And maybe for the 50 years, it helped the building. And during the extensive restoration of it, the stainless steel roofing and also um, also the tie, tie rods, as you see, were added. So to hold the, hold the top of the uh, building in order to prevent the outer plane movement first. And also when you have a lateral force to make the building sway in a uniform motion. So if you have, have that, you don't have the collapse. If every element moves in independently, then you can have the collapse of the world. Basic Then after structural restoration, you can see the, um, the, walk, the flying buckets is on the top floor point and then some stones replaced. Then you can see also um, circular ties and a, and a cover on top of the min remains of the minaret because of the vertical track also. These ties were as well. Then on the side you can see the excavation carried out by the Department of Antiquities in 1990s, I think, the parts of the minarets and the Turkish triangles that are found, which can give you an idea of how the minaret was. But an idea is not enough to reconstruct. So you have an idea, but you don't have a, a drawing or a picture, so it is not accepted to reconstruct without having a concrete, um, concrete proof. And these are our flying buttons uh, by the on the down floor after, um, after restoration. Injections were carried out and also pointing. 
uh, stone replacement. And so all these past, antique, and recent measures uh, enabled the St. Peter and Paul Church, Sinan Pachamos, to reach today. And uh, especially in places like Cyprus, where it's, there are difficulties in um, central archiving, it is a difficult process to conduct historical research before restoration. And, uh, but as you know, the historical research is the first thing that you have to do before restoration, and it's, a, it's an essential. In an active earthquake zone like Cyprus, we, a restoration specialists, have to search the past seismic events and the behavior of these buildings during these natural disasters. This has to form an important part of our historical research before restoration. Because to know the magnitudes of these past earthquakes endured by the historical building, and to know how the past measures already taken against them, is an enlightenment for us in deciding our intervention. It gives us the possibility to judge the past interventions under the light of modern science. So like I said, you find the past intervention, then you can remedy them as under the light of modern knowledge. This first intervention can be identified by non-destructive testing methods like GPR and infrared camera, along with historical research. So I'd like to thank you for your participation.